Hey everyone, welcome back to Shop Life. We are still working on this E46M3, but we are getting to a point where it's almost done and ready to be delivered to the owner. So the owner hasn't even seen this car in person yet. We literally got it here straight from the auction, as you guys remember in our previous videos, and we've just been wrenching away, getting all this mechanical stuff straightened away. But in this video, we're gonna be doing the rod bearings on this E46M3. So if, as you guys are aware, the E46 M3 has the S54 engine, which had a rod bearing issue, especially for the earlier models. So 2001, 2002, 2003, and BMW addressed this with a recall where they updated those rod bearings. But the newer S54, so 04 and newer, they had the updated rod bearings with different rod bolts and all of that in it from factory. But even then, the rod bearings are still a wear item and this engine has about 120,000 miles and the owner wanted me to go ahead and upgrade those rod bearings. So that's what we're gonna do here today. Originally, I was going to film a full DIY on this, but we've already spent way too long on this car working on it. We've been trying to film as much stuff as we can. So I'm gonna film this as a vlog style, but don't be afraid. We are gonna do a full DIY on the S54 rod bearings when I do it on my personal car, the E46 sedan with the S54 swap, because my car needs it as well. But on this one, this video, I'm just gonna give you all the tips and tricks and you'll just see the whole general overview of the process. It just won't be a full detailed step-by-step -step DIY. So as you can see, I already have the engine support bar set up. We still have quite a few things removed from the whole SMG conversion, but we've got the transmission back on. So we've got this engine support bar in place because we are gonna be removing the whole front subframe to get access to that oil pan. Let's just get right to it. Let's start removing that whole front subframe assembly so that way we can get that oil pan removed. So here's a quick rundown. Obviously we have all of our covers and everything already removed from underneath the car, underneath the engine, I should say. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually remove this whole front subframe section. So there's a lot of stuff that attaches to the front subframe. The control arms attach, the steering rack attaches, and then it also attaches to the engine mounts. So I already went ahead and took off the engine mount nuts from the actual engine side of things. So there's two 16 millimeter nuts, one on each side, but I got both of those out and that was easy to do from the top for the driver side. Passenger side, I had to do it from right here. Now what we're gonna do next is we're actually gonna remove the steering column, so the shaft that goes into the steering rack. So we're gonna remove that. We're also gonna remove the power steering pump from the actual engine itself, as well as some of the hoses that attach to the rack. And then we're gonna have to remove the control arm ball joints from both hubs for the steering knuckles. And we're also gonna remove the tie rod ends just from the steering knuckle. So we're gonna remove all of that. The sway bar can actually stay on the car. It's not really in the way. We're just gonna remove it from the frame of the car. So that pretty much gives you the gist of everything that needs to come off to get the subframe off. The subframe itself is held in with these e-torx bolts on the E46 M3. On normal non-Ms, it's actually held in with a 18 millimeter normal hex socket bolt. So yeah. Now I'm just gonna start doing it. I'm not gonna really stop in between. If you guys need to do this on your car, just refer to everything that I just said, and you'll still see the process on the video. Let's do it.
Ooh, I feel metal. Ooh, these rod brains about to be. <laughs> oh man. I think we're doing this just in time. Oh yeah, you can see the flakes. I've got the oil pan drained. You can definitely see some metal shavings. You can see those sparkly flakes? That is rod bearing material. It could also be main bearing material, but as I'm looking at the rod bearings themselves, they are definitely worn and this does seem like rod bearing material. So I think it's a great thing that we decided to go ahead and do these rod bearings because I mean, if we just let it keep going like this, it's gonna be a bad day pretty soon. And now I'm actually really worried because my car has a S54 out of an 04 M3 when I did the swap and I never did the rod bearings on there. And my car's at 160,000 miles. And when I did my first S54 swap into my previous E46, that same engine, I really beat on it back then because that was when I was like 17 and I was really beating on it. So now I'm actually really worried on how my rod bearings look. And like I said previously in this video, I will be doing a full, you know, in-depth tutorial on this rod bearing uh, procedure. Pretty soon we'll see how mine are looking. Now I'm actually kind of scared to drive my car. Oh man. You mean more than you already are? More than I already am. This is what sucks about knowing things. It does. That it, Honestly, like everybody always tells me that you're so scared of driving my Even the F80. Car. Even the F80, exactly. Because, because of the crank hub. Because of the crank hub. I haven't done this crank hub fix on the F80 yet. I'm still weighing my options on which one I want to do. And that prevents me from doing stuff like you see all these other YouTubers doing that get really popular. You know, what I consider as kind of dangerous to the mechanical well-being of the car. But all these other people don't really care because obviously they have enough money to take care of it. I don't. I'd rather have a bunch of different cars. And my car, when I first did the swap, I beat on it like crazy before I got my first car and I did the swap on there. I had it done it. I had done it on a green E46 that's on E46 Fanatics, if you look it up on there. And I had done the whole swap on there and I beat on it like crazy because I didn't care about the body. I didn't care. Like I was young. I didn't know all this information back then. So that's one thing. Once you know too much, you kind of, you know, stop yourself from doing stuff that's detrimental to the car. And I mean, I hope one day I have enough money where I don't have to worry about detrimental side effects to the stuff that I want to do, like drifting or t tracking a car, where you don't have to worry. If something breaks, you got enough money to take care of it. Oh man, hopefully soon we'll be in that position. But for right now, let's get back to these rod bearings. I gotta clean up this whole oil pan situation, get all this stuff cleaned up, and then we'll continue on. You can, as you can tell, I mean, it's not completely worn through. So, I mean, it's a good thing that we are replacing these. Oh, look at the wear marks on this one. You see the top one is much more worn than the bottom one. So here's the deal. I've got four cylinders that I already did all the rod bearing stuff on. I'm gonna show you how those look. We've got two left and that's the ones I'm actually gonna give you guys the tips and tricks on. So here's the first four that I did. Cylinder one, two, five, and six. So you do them usually in pairs 
because as you're turning the crankshaft, it lines up two cylinders for you. So cylinder six is definitely the worst, as you can see right here. And all of the top sections of the rod bearings are worse than the bottom, which is typical on the S54. So that's not something that you know we really have to worry about. And you can see right here, it's already going through all of the coatings. Well, actually these are not really coated, but it's going through the bearing material pretty quickly and it's wearing down. So it's already went through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, almost on the eighth layer, if they do it in layers, but it's all the way down there. Now you can see this one for cylinder five is just right here in the middle mostly. And then you can see some wear pattern on the sides, but this one's, I mean, obviously it's wearing down just in one section like that. Cylinder two is similar to cylinder six, worn down pretty well. Now cylinder one tells a little different of a story. You see it's kind of missing like a chunk. So it's still wearing down in the middle and you can see this line right here. So usually that happens when some kind of debris got in there and that's why that happened. But what's a little bit weirder is there's no marks like that on the bottom side of cylinder one. So not entirely sure what happened there. So I mean, here's the thing with rod bearings and the reason why I like to use ARP bolts. So if you look on the forums, you're probably gonna see a lot of people that recommend uh, not using the ARP. They recommend using the OEM fasteners. That way you don't oval out the actual rods, uh, like the, where the bolt goes into, because when you torque down these ARP bolts, that's pe people are afraid of ovaling it out because it might require more torque. But the reason I like using ARP bolts is because you can use this stretch gauge. And the stretch gauge pretty much tells you how much the bolt is stretching as you're tightening it down. And as you can see, like the rod bearings have uneven wear. It's not like every single bearing is worn exactly the same. And usually rod bearing wear happens over time because of either clearances from factory, debris getting into there. It's not supposed to be a wear item like that, but most of these high power or high performance engines, it is. And usually what happens is the, the torque is what really causes these bearings to wear unevenly because some fasteners are torqued a little bit differently. Not, no fastener is going to be exactly identical to the fastener right after it. That's why I like to use a stretch gauge because you can measure how much that bolt stretches and you get a more accurate of a reading for these rod bolts rather than just going off of the torque value or even just the angle value. So. That's pretty much the rundown there. And I'll get more into detail with that when we do the actual rod bearing full complete DIY on my car, because it definitely needs it. If these are looking like this, mine are probably gonna be a lot worse. So here's just a quick tip and trick that, you know, here are the rod bolts. What I do is I like to measure all of these rod bolts with the caliper, and I also just check what reading they're getting with the stretch gauge before it's stretched at all. And you wanna write down all these measurements because if you, the good thing about these ARP bolts is you can reuse them. So if somebody does rod bearings on this car again, they're able to reuse those bolts only if they haven't stretched. So that's why you wanna take down those measurements. That way, whenever somebody goes back in there, then when they pull a the bolt out, they double check and see if that bolt has stretched more than the given amount. And if, that, if it has, they have to replace it. But usually it's not that big of a deal. Most likely nobody's going back in here for a long time. So the bearings that we're using, like I said before, are the VAC bearings that are, uh, I believe they're coated, not treated. But I mean, if you look on the forums and if you look at VAC Motorsports, talk to the guys that actually put these on day after day and that have done all the research, they pretty much say, I mean, these bearings are not gonna be an issue. I mean, they're not gonna cause any other issues. They should wear a lot better than the factory ones as well. And I believe they are extra clearance. So there's a little bit more clearance in these than the stock ones. And with paired with those rod bolts, we're gonna have perfect torque, perfect stretch. Shouldn't have anything to worry about with those. The only other bearings that we might have to worry about in the future would be those main bearings. But that's a whole nother ordeal. That's not something that you can just do with the engine in the car. You're pretty much rebuilding most of the engine at that point. But yeah, so when you're putting these rod bolts on, the ARP bolts, you wanna use the ARP Ultra Torque uh, assembly lube. And you also want to use some kind of assembly lube on all of the new rod bearings but you only wanna put assembly lube on the mating surface where it goes to the crankshaft, not on the backside. So if you're doing this yourself, make sure you do that. And then, you know, a lot of people, if you are a professional engine builder, you're gonna have multiple of these stretch gauges. The ARP stretch gauge is not cheap. I think it's like $200, $300. And ideally, I would wanna have two as well. If I was doing more engine builds and stuff like that, I would definitely have two of these because you don't want to just have to keep moving it around 
that you might lose some of the calibration. So ideally you want two of these. You can buy cheaper ones. I haven't used the cheaper ones, so I can't really attest for which ones are good, but I'll show you why you want to use two here in a little bit. But like what I'm doing, I'm just using a torque wrench. The ARP bolts come with uh, instructions on how much stretch you need to achieve, as well as if you don't have a stretch gauge, how much torque you want to use. But let me go ahead and tell you guys this much. It says 50 foot pounds of torque, and I have already done four cylinders, and all of them were had to be more than 50 foot pounds of torque to achieve that proper stretch. So if you would have went off of those 50 foot pounds, you would be under torqued, maybe not by a lot, but that's still, you know, being under torqued. All right, let's see how the engine's looking right now. So you can see I've got cylinder one, two, five, and six done. I left cylinder three and four for the last. That way you guys can see a little bit better. And you can see some red stuff coming out from these rods. Um, and that's just the actual assembly loop that I used. Um, and then we're cleaning all this stuff. When you're cleaning all of the caps and stuff while I'm about to do it here, you wanna make sure you're using lint-free cloths, towels, whatever you're using. What I like to do is use coffee filters because coffee filters, do not leave any lint behind. Otherwise you'll be drinking lint in your coffee when you're making them. So coffee filters are the way to go because you don't have to worry about that. And when you're using a cleaner, I like to use brake cleaner on everything. It works for everything, right? But you never want to spray brake cleaner directly into the engine because we're changing the rod bearings, but there's also the main bearings and you don't want brake cleaner and stuff like any other contaminants going anywhere else that they're not supposed to be there. So what I like to do is I like to just spray the coffee filter down and clean it up as I'm doing it. The factory bolts on here are M10 because this is a 2006 and that's just gonna be uh, external Torx 12. So I'm just gonna loosen one at a time. We're just gonna do one cylinder at a time. So right now we're doing cylinder three. Sometimes you, these caps won't come off, or most times they won't. You might just have to give it a little tap and it'll pop right off. And now you can see how these are cracked rods. So they only go in a certain way. And it's also marked to tell you which way goes where. So it's kind of, once we clean these up, you can see there's a dot on here. So that dot is gonna to go towards the driver's side. So in US, it's the left side. All right, let's clean it up, push that off and get that rod bearing out as well. Now, when you're taking off that top bearing, you want to be very, very careful. You don't want to damage the crankshaft at all. So we're going to push it straight up. Get it up high enough and then let it go this way to the side. And now to take the rod bearing out, you want to, I'll show you better on the actual cap. Let me go ahead and pull this one off. And it's the same story here. The top of the bearing is definitely a lot worse than the bottom. And here it is a little bit cleaned up. So this, as you can see, is pretty bad too. It's one of the worst ones as well. Uh, obviously the cylinder six was even worse than this. But yeah, I mean, it's a good thing that we're changing them, honestly. All right, so you can see how there's a tang right here on the cap. There's also a tang on the rod side as well. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna push away like that from the tang. You can push it right from the middle and that's gonna release it. And you just pull it right out. Now you can see the underside has a little bit of wear as well. It's not really wear per se, it's just when this bearing is sitting against it, that pressure, it's got a little bit of marking on it. We're gonna clean it up as best as we can, but we're, obviously we're not gonna grease this side at all. So we're not, we don't really have to worry about this sliding around in there as long as there's not really any damage in there. If there's any damage in there, then you're 
kind of, you kind of really don't have that many options. You got to take the engine out. You're going to pretty much start rebuilding it at that point. And the main reason for that is because these are crack rods. So this cap only goes to that actual rod. So what we're going to have to do is you want to make sure everything is put back the exact same way. The reason they crack it is because when it's cracked, it's going to be a perfect fit. As you can see, all of this is very rough. It's not like a machine surface. So since it's rough, just like when you, when you break like a piece of glass, right? And you try to put the glass back together, it's only going to go together however it shattered. Now I'm just cleaning the rod side because we want to make sure there's no oil or anything on there. And what you could do is you could actually cut out a piece of cardboard to protect this section, but I'm holding it with my other hand and I'm being very careful and we're going to clean the crankshaft side as well. And we're going to also put assembly lube on there. Now I got my hands cleaned up and I got the bearing, the underside of the bearing cleaned up. Now we're going to put this on there. It's going to be hard for me to show you guys on this as well, but I'll show you guys on the actual cap. And with the VAC bearings, there actually doesn't matter which way you, which orientation you use for the top or the bottom. But if you have the factory ones, they're marked which one goes on the top and the bottom. Now, another thing that you would ideally want to do is you want to plastic gauge all of these bearings to make sure all the clearances are where you want them. But with the VAC bearings, they're extra clearanced. So it's not something that even if you plastic gauged it, there's not really much you can do because I mean, it's not like you're going to, you're going to be able to add material or take it off. So either way, you don't really have any option. And that's why I like the VAC bearings because of that coating and their success rate is pretty good. So we don't really have to worry about that. But if you were rebuilding this entire engine, that's something that you would want to do is you want to plastic gauge it and make sure you're getting all the right sizes for everything, right clearances, and then go from there. So the main thing is you want to have that tang lined up again. All right, so here's the tang that I was talking about. You want to line the tang up, then you push it in. Now you can see how everything is lined up, the tang is right there. And what's going to happen is when you actually tighten this back up, it's going to crush it a little bit to make a, even more of a tight seal against the cap and against the rod side, because we have the other bearing that's right here. So when these two come together, it'll just make sure that it gets pushed right where it needs to go. And that's why you want to have that tang lined up because that tang is what guides everything to make sure it stays exactly where it needs to. Now the next step is assembly lube. So there's a lot of assembly lubes. Red line is a really good one. This Permatex stuff works really well. So you want to be liberal with this, but you try it. You don't want to get it in the holes. So you just want to get it only on that bearing. You can see how sticky it is. And this is so that way we don't have a dry start. When you first turn on this car after we do these rod bearings, this is going to keep that coating on there. And it's very sticky, so we don't have to worry about any dry starting. And now we're going to do the same thing on the engine side, on the rod. You want to loop that one up. This one's going to be, the one on the rod is going to be a little bit trickier because gravity is going to try to push it down. But what I like to do is I just use my finger, get it all over there as much as I can, and then I put it on the crankshaft as well. And this stuff can get anywhere, it doesn't matter. Now we're going to bring the rod back down and guide it onto the crank journal. And that's one thing, when you're doing this rod bearing job, your hands are going to be super dry. I like to have one glove on for all that assembly lube and stuff, and then the other, I just have to, I like to have my bare hand, that way I have a good grip. You don't want to scratch up that journal, you don't want anything rattling around. All right, we've got the rod in place. Now time to put the cap on. Now on this fastener, I already have the ARP lube on the head side of it, as well as the threads. So I just like to screw it in a little bit, that way my hand slip or something, I don't want that rod cap falling out. But now I'm just going to push it together, and you're going to see where it meets the rod, it should close up that gap, almost where you can't even see it anymore.
So I've got them tying down just a little bit, no torque on them really, just pretty much hand tight. And we're just gonna check the stretch right now. Uh, you kinda want a little bit of preload on it to use that stretch gauge accurately. Um, and I think depending on your stretch gauge, it'll tell you exactly what it's at. We just barely need any. And then from there, we're gonna zero the gauge out and then we're gonna actually torque it down and see how much it stretches. So this is where it helps to have two stretch gauges because you can put one on each side that way you don't have to keep moving it around because you do want to torque these evenly. You don't really want to just torque down one side and get this one stretched out completely with no torque on this one. So what I like to do is I check the stretch, measure it, write it down for both sides, zero it out on one and then put an indicator on the other one. And then I actually use a torque wrench, get it to 50 foot pounds like ARP says for these bolts and then check the stretch again. And from there, if we need to add more torque to get them to stretch more, we'll go in that order. So you'll see when I do it here shortly. So right now I've got the gauge zeroed out. And on these ARP bolts, there's a dimple on this side and a smaller one on the other side, which is why we have this pointy tip. So you just wanna make sure it gets into that point. So you can see right now, the stretch is showing at 38 thousandths. And what we need it to be is we're gonna zero it out and then when you're torquing it, once it's zeroed out, we want it to get it to six and a half thousandths or seven thousandths. So on the gauge, so here's five thousandths. And according to ARP for this specification, we need it to be between six and a half to seven thousandths. Let me put this dial. So we need it right in between those black indicators. So I got this one stretched, I torqued it down to 55 foot pounds and it's actually stretched right under 7,000. So we're perfect on this one. And then on this side, I actually marked where it was when this one was zeroed out. So now we just need to add six and a half thousandths to seven thousandths to where it was showing up on there. And as you can see, I torqued them both evenly. That way we don't have to worry about one side seating pro improperly or anything like that, which it probably wouldn't, but better to be safe than sorry. And this one's perfect too. This one is a little bit, or it's around seven and a half thousandths, which is perfect because when this bolt was zeroed out, this one showed up at half of a thousandth. And just like that, rod bearing's done. Now trying to film it, as you can see, it takes a lot longer for me to do it. I'm always running back and forth. I'm gonna go ahead and get the other cylinder done. Then we can start cleaning all this up. <laughs> well, all I see is my nose. <laughs> all I see is your eyes. Oh, so I'm just gonna clean all this up after we get that last one done, and then we should be good. That look weird. Cool. All right, so this one, I'm actually gonna film it for TikTok. If you guys aren't following me already on there, make sure you do so. It's at Shop Life TV like everywhere else. All right, so we got the rod bearings all finished up. Got a couple other things left to do. We've got to put the oil pump back on. We're also going to replace that O-ring that's on the oil pump pickup tube. If you're ever doing rod bearings or any time where you have your oil pump pickup tube removed, you wanna make sure you replace that O-ring because if you don't replace that O-ring, it doesn't seat properly or it's just not holding up as it should, what's gonna happen is you're gonna start losing oil pressure because that's how that oil pump pickup tube works is based off of suction from the tube. So if that O-ring is not, you know, making a 100% proper seal, you're just gonna have a little bit lower oil pressure or you might have other issues. So that's one thing that you wanna make sure you do. So we've got the oil pan back on, put all the power steering stuff as well. As you saw, I went ahead and also replaced the power steering lines because they were leaking. And we also replaced the reservoir because the reservoir has a built-in filter. So if you just change the hoses and you don't change the reservoir, you're not really changing that filter. So we got all that done, changed all those O-rings, any other gaskets that we had access to, just changed all of that. And we also went ahead and put the subframe back on. As you saw though, we kept the stock engine mounts, the original ones still on there, 
We are gonna replace those, but I still got a couple other stuff to do on the transmission side. So there's still gonna be some stress on those engine mounts. So I didn't wanna change those until I've got everything else put back together and then we'll put the new engine mounts on. But yeah, besides that, I think that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll start finishing up everything else as far as the SMG conversion stuff is concerned. And even up on the top, we've got to put the intake manifolds and all that stuff back together. So it's pretty much just reassembly at this point. And then hopefully we get the first start after all this work on the next video. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure you're checking out our TikTok and Instagram. We're uploading a lot more frequently on there, as well as little tips and tricks while I'm doing all this work. So. That's it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you guys in the next one.